Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, presented by the Business Courier. The fix is on at City Hall. We'll have details on the pension plan fiscal fix. Take a look inside 8451, or you may know it as the Dunhumby Building at 5th and Race downtown. And one of the top administrators at NKU wants to change perceptions about higher education. U.S. Bank Business Watch is next. Good morning and welcome to U.S. Bank Business Watch. I'm Peg Rasconi. On the Business Courier front page centerpiece this week, Mayor John Cranley calls it the greatest threat to the city he was elected to run. It is the city's $829 million debt caused by the pension system, and the fix is critical. Cranley's strategy was to get about 4,400 city retirees to file a class action lawsuit. The retirees came to the table, and U.S. District Judge Michael Barrett is expected to approve a settlement by the end of the year. Now, it sounds odd, but the move will save the city at least $300 million in pension payments, $107 million in retiree health care payments, and bring the city retirement system to 100% funding within 30 years, assuming the pension fund achieves a 7.5% annual return rate. The settlement removes a financial crisis that threatened the city's credit rating, reputation, and ability to self-determine its future. Business Courier reporter Chris Wetterick's in-depth story in this week's print edition breaks down the complicated pension issue and resolution. He joins Rob Dawmeyer in the studio this morning with more on the complicated fix for Cincinnati. Chris and Rob. Thanks very much, Peg, and thanks for being here, Chris. Thanks for having me. Most of us aren't lucky enough to have pensions. No. Uh, but. <laughs> Uh, but city employees do have them, and as Peg mentioned, um, this was a threat to the city. My first question to you is, why is, was this pension problem uh, such a threat? Well, they owed more than the city owed more than eight hundred million dollars to the Cincinnati retirement system, and like a lot of cities and states across the country, this is a major fiscal problem. This affects your bond rating, which affects how much it costs you to, to borrow money. It also means, you know, if they had to pay this off um, the way that it was looking like they would have to. Um, it could have crowded out money for basic city services, police, fire, roads, streetcar operations, just about anything. Um, so they needed to solve this problem in a way that didn't uh, really crush the city's ability to do the things it needs to do every year. And so that's what they've, that's what they've done. That 800 plus million dollars, that's a staggering amount of money. How did we get here? How did, how did Cincinnati's pension uh, plan get so far in the hole? Well, it really was about three reasons. One was the, the 2008 crash really uh, impacted the returns they were getting on their, on their pension uh, investments. That was the first thing. The second was the city wasn't putting, on what it, putting in what it should have um, from an actuary's point of view. They should have put in more money at certain times than they did. And so, you know, that, that, really, that really increased the pension debt um, to, to where, it, where it ended up. Now, you put this into context. Cincinnati is by no means alone um, as cities or states that have this kind of problem. And I know you looked, uh, when you were doing the story, you looked around at, at some other cities um, that have really some incredible debt. Uh, Chicago, to name one city, I, think, I can't remember the number, but it was in the billions. Right. Um, what, uh, what can, other, can other cities use this, that what Cincinnati has done with this fix? Is, is this something that's transferable to other places? You know, the people I talked to said maybe. Um, the one thing that really stands out with Cincinnati is that while it poorly funded the pension fund, it really did well in funding its retiree health care fund. And what Mayor Cranley did and, uh, to get people to the table um, particularly the retirees who weren't taking any cuts um, as compared to normal employees had up until this point. Uh, what he did was say, um, you know, we don't have to provide retiree health care, and if you don't come to the table, we might get rid of it so that we can afford these pension payments. And so what he, was a what he was able to do is move a lot of money from the retiree health care fund into the pension fund, and that will really bolster the fund going forward and really allow them to get to this 100 percent funding level within the next three decades. I think it was a really creative fix. I think we, we, we can agree on that, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it later. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. And Peg, back to you. All right, thanks, gentlemen, and again, great coverage in the print edition on that. 
Well, the pace of progress at the bank's mixed-use development is picking up. The city county committee overseeing the bank's project unanimously recommended a developer for a new hotel. It will be an AC hotel by Marriott, like this one, developed by two local companies, Eagle and Weingartner. It's a high-end hotel that won't receive any taxpayer assistance. The bank's developer has long proposed a more downscale hotel on this site, such as a Hilton Garden Inn, but Red's owner Bob Castellini insisted on a first-class hotel. It'll cost about 180 per night and will be, will be aimed at millennials who now account for 50 percent of all hotel bookings. Officials say those additional rooms are needed. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so much momentum in Cincinnati right now. It's been building for several years. And when you look at all the investment uh, in downtown from the banks to Fountain Square to Over the Rhine and even further than that, um, there's a lot of demand. We had 24.1 million visitors come to Cincinnati last year and they have to stay somewhere. If all goes as planned, the $35 million project is expected to break ground this fall, and that may be a big if. Late last week, the design of the proposed hotel was panned by members of the Urban Design Review Board, the group that advises the city manager on the look of projects in the city's urban core. Well, the business career recently got a look inside what was once known as Dunhumby Center, the much-anticipated new building at 5th and Ray Streets downtown. Hundreds of employees joined city leaders, local executives, and others for the unveiling of the $125 million building that will house what is now called 8451, the consumer analytics firm that was purchased from Dunhumby by, by Kroger last week. The modern concrete exterior finishes are carried into the more than 280,000 square foot office that features a flood of natural light and open workspaces. Uh, we are open space, open plan. No one has an office. I don't have an office. We're all in the same, uh, uh, we're all in this together, we're all working together. Uh, from a collaborative environment standpoint, we have small little offices, large offices, we have open plan seating area. So whatever environment you feel most conducive to innovation thinking, we have it for you here. Like the walking desk, there are five floors of office space above a garage in the 8451 building. Each floor of the office has a Cincinnati-themed coffee room. And while 8451 opens, keep in mind Dunhumby isn't going anywhere. The consumer data analysis firm expects to double its employee base across the company in the next two years. According to managing director Andy Hill, Hill says he plans to add up to 250 workers to Dun Dunhumby's 200 U.S. employees. Dunhumby works with retailers such as Cincinnati-based Macy's, GNC, and Office Depot. It analyzes customer behaviors and helps retailers target ads, marketing, and products to their customers customers' needs. Bill Hillenbrand says his parents' pool cover inspired him to invent a motorized mattress that could transform health care. The mattress, dubbed the Hercules Patient Repositioner, can lift a patient weighing up to 750 pounds. Well, the Hercules Patient Repositioner really helps eliminate caregiver back injuries. With the push of a button, it allows one caregiver to pull a patient up in bed. Um, that's simple, less pain for the patient and uh, convenient for both the patient and caregiver. Hillenbrand says he got the idea while watching his parents lift their pool cover, which works in a very similar way to the mattress. The mattress came to market in March of 2014. Christ Hospital bought 26 and could order more after recently concluding a study of the product. The mattresses cost six to $8,000 a piece. The Business Couriers list this week is focused on highest paid university officials. Sue Ott Rowlands is vice president and provost at Northern Kentucky University and just missed being in the top 25. She is the third highest paid executive at NKU. She says higher education has changed dramatically in the past several years and still faces several misconceptions as a business. And the higher education institutions are by and large really very efficient institutions, but the belief is that there's a lot of waste, and so the continued pressure for more efficiencies, more accountability. Rowland says she is from a family of teachers, and that's how she ended up in higher education. There are more new adventures for children to have on the Cincinnati Riverfront after more openings at Smell Park. The Heakin Family PNC Grow Up Great Adventure Playground is now open. It's designed to incorporate opportunities for motor skill development, decision making, learning, fantasy play, and social development for children of all ages and abilities. Also open is the Sue and Joe Pickler Family Fountains, where kids and adults can splash and play. These features join the long-anticipated Carol Ann's Carousel, which includes Cincinnati-centric horses. 
Well, Cincinnati is also known for its craft beer, and if you're a regular viewer of this program, you know we work hard to keep you up to speed on this topic. And this summer, the city's newest brewery will begin canning one of its most popular beers. That would be Taft's Ale House, and the beer is Nellie's Key, Key Lime Caribbean Ale. The plan is to start offering it for sale at the brewery in individual cans and six packs in early June. The owners say Nellie's is consistently the most popular beer poured almost every night at the Ale House. Up next on U.S. Bank Business Watch, Kroger may be preparing to do battle with a new competitor. And who's paid more, the football coach or the president? The business courier list of UC salaries is getting a lot of website hits. Some news now that's getting a lot of attention on the Business Courier website and social media sites. Two of the world's biggest supermarket operators are discussing a merger, a move that could have a big impact on Cincinnati-based Kroger. Kroger competes with supermarkets operated by Dutch company Royal Ahold and Brussels, Belgium-based Del Hayes Group. The companies confirmed last week they're talking about merging. Ahold operates giant food stores in Maryland, Virginia, and Washington, D.C., which are growth markets for Kroger. The Courier's list of highest paid employees at the University of Cincinnati is getting a lot of attention. Head football coach Tommy Tuberville tops the list and makes nearly, nearly double what President Santa Ono was paid in 2014. Tuberville was paid $900,000 while Ono earned $525,000. For a full list of all employee salaries, you can visit the Business Courier website. Ten local high schools are among the best in the state of Ohio, including the number one school, Walnut Hills, Indian Hill was number two, Wyoming number four, Marymount number ten, and Madeira ranked 13th. For the full list, you can visit the Business Courier website. The Cincinnati Reds have hired Hall of Fame shortstop Barry Larkin. The Cincinnati native will serve as a minor league roving infield instructor, coming back to the Reds organization after a 19-season career that lasted from 1986 to 2004. Larkin was the 1995 National League's most valuable player, and he was inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame in 2012. In this morning's U.S. Bank Economic 360, we're talking stuff, the kind all of us buy. Some important economic numbers were released last week in the form of retail sales for April, and it wasn't very good, at least not as good as expected. U.S. Bank Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager Mike Deneman is in the studio with producer Kelly Leon to talk about what it means. Mike and Kelly. Thanks, Peg. Well, obviously, we're not doing a good enough job with our spending. <laughs> What have you been doing this weekend? I know. Got to get out. Got to right. get by in. So um, wh why is this number important? What does it tell us? Well, it, sure. It, it's one of the more closely watched of the indicators because our economy is so focused on the consumer. And because of this, you know, if we know what the consumer is spending, where he's spending it, that gives us a pretty good idea of how the economy as a whole is doing. And so it's it's more elaborate than it sounds. It, you know, when you say retail sales, yeah. it kind of sounds like, you know, how many shirts did Macy's sell right. last month? And it, it is that, of course, but then it's it's so much broader reaching. I mean, clothing, food, cars, gas, yes, uh, yeah. going out and eating, uh -huh. uh, furniture, washing machines, anything that the consumer would spend money on is included in this number. And not just brick and mortar stores either, but also online purchases. So it's really all encompassing. And because of that, it gives us a pretty good snapshot at any one particular time of how the economy is doing. So what went wrong with this quarter? What went wrong with the number? Yeah, the expectation was much better than the reality, and that, mm -hmm. that was disappointing. Um, looking at April, we were expecting a nice increase over March uh, that uh, you know things would have picked up nicely. Unfortunately, the number was basically flat, so showing no improvement over the previous month. And mm. the reason that's somewhat of a concern is, you know, we've talked in recent shows that there are some nice tailwinds out there right now for the consumer. Some things stacked in the consumer's favor. Uh, the price of gas, for instance, remains very reasonable. Mm -hmm. That puts more money in the consumer's pocket. Right. Theoretically, that should flow through into yeah. retail sales. Right. Um, and then the weather. Uh, 
we talked about how the consumer just doesn't spend a great deal when the weather is lousy. And now that spring's here, we should have seen a nice rebound. But yes. unfortunately, neither of those things really seem to have contributed. So mm -hmm. we, we got the disappointing number. And you know that could be cause for some additional concern. So when economists look at these numbers, what does that tell them about the future as we move forward? Um, I would say that right now it's too soon to make any definitive conclusions. But depending on whether you're glass half full or, or half empty, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're taking an optimistic view, you would think, well, maybe we just haven't had that spring bounce yet. I mean, we're talking April, and there was still snow on the ground just a few weeks before, so people maybe weren't in the mood to go out and do their spring shopping. And if that's the case, we should see a real nice rebound in May. If your glass half empty, though, perhaps this is an indication that maybe the consumer just doesn't feel very good about their personal financial situation, and they're really cutting down on their spending. Yeah. If that's the case, and this is a trend, because the economy is so concentrated on the consumer, that could be, that could be a, a, a real concern. So yeah. a lot of eyes will be focused on the May number. It'll be more important, really, I think, than the April number was because mm -hmm. of what we just had happen. Right. So uh, we'll, we'll wait for that, and we'll, we'll cross our fingers. All right. Well, we'll talk about it maybe, yeah. maybe uh, in a couple of months. Hopefully I bring some good news. Yeah, that would be good. <laughs> You're always good news, Mike. We love having you here. Thank you, Kelly. We appreciate you and U.S. Bank. Thanks. Peg, back to you. All right, thanks, Kelly and Mike. And still to come on U.S. Bank Business Watch, family and private businesses like La Rosa's are critical to a community's economic success. We'll talk about an organization that helps both succeed. And congratulations to Justin Dobbs, General Accounting Manager at Nielsen, another 40 under 40 honoree. In this morning's Business Insight, the Gehring Center for Family and Private Business is gearing up for its annual Tri-State Family and Private Business All-Star Awards nominations, closed in April, and the deadline to directly apply for an award is just two weeks away. For more than 20 years, the Gehring Center has helped local, family, and private businesses be proactive, learn from experience, and gain real-world insights from other business owners. It's a unique and important part of the local business scene. Larry Grip, president of the Gehring Center, joins business courier publisher Jamie Smith in the studio with more on the center and the upcoming awards. Jamie and Larry. Thanks, Peg. Larry, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, it's great to be with you again, Jamie. You know, I, I think I take for, for granted that not everybody knows what the Gearing Center does. You know, tell our audience a little bit more about what your real mission is and what you do for the region. Oh, sure. Glad to. <laughs> uh, the Gearing Center is a not-for-profit that's affiliated with UC's Lindner College of Business. And so we're an extension out into the community to our mission is to nurture and educate family and private businesses to drive a vibrant regional economy. So we provide educational and connection experiences for the region's family and private business. Okay, and I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize is the private part of it. Everybody, I think, knows the family part of it, but private business is a big part as well. Absolutely. Well, that's good. Now, I know you, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary. Talk a little bit about the special things that are going on with that. Right. Well, in the late 1980s, John Gehring, who had been a college professor and then the registrar of UC, uh, went back to his family businesses and um, he started the Gehring Center via a contribution to the UC Foundation and the College of Business. And for 25 years, we've been reaching out into the community and helping family and private businesses learn from each other, learn from our curriculum, but simply to get better. And uh, so over that 25 years, uh, we've, we've impacted hundreds of businesses here in our region, and so we want to celebrate that. Yeah. And uh, including we're going to be publishing a book featuring 15 companies as examples of the companies who, who've participated and grown because of their relationship with the College that's of Business and the Gehring Center. Well, that's awesome. Well, we're talking a little bit about the Family and Private Business Awards coming up. Uh, I know each year for the last four years, is it, that we've had the Hall of Fame Five award? Five years. Five years, okay. Uh, we've named this year's Hall of Fame winner? Right. Well, Hall of Fame is really, we look for a family, an individual, or a company that exemplifies what we would want 
in a great company in our region. That is uh, a company that's growing in their employment base that helps the, the image of our region to be great, which we know it is, but really getting the word out countrywide, and then that are involved, engaged in our community, and, and show signs of philanthropy. Okay. So this year, we have a model company, a fourth generation business, The Graders, uh -huh. who we're celebrating into the Hall of Fame. So they're fourth generation going into fifth, and they've been involved in the community, and as Oprah says, <laughs> they have the best ice cream in the country. <laughs> that they do. I've sampled it once or twice, I think. <laughs> So that, that's uh, you know, a big part of the awards. There will also be other awards for different sizes Correct. of family and private business as well. Correct. That's exactly right. And our applications are coming in now. Last year we had over 100 applicants. Oh, that's we great. We have 550 companies nominated by others. And uh, we'll narrow it down and award 18 awards in six different categories. So that's we're all awesome. set, and uh, the apps are coming in right now. Well, that's great. I know we're going to have a full screen to kind of let our viewers know, but it is August 25th. Correct. I believe at Music Hall. Correct. It's a wonderful event. I've been there, I think, uh, the last uh, 10 years at least. Right. And it's just a lot of fun to see. You know, not, not not just see companies get awards, but hear their stories. Exactly. And you know, to mingle and network with those people is you know is a precious precious time, I think. Right, and we'll have over 700 people there again. Oh, that's so great. we're excited about that. We're we're following the All Star theme. Oh, that's right. The Castellinis a couple of years ago were our Hall of Fame winners, and they've been very active with us since that time. Before that, but especially right. since then, and including on July 17th, we have. Uh, Family Business Day at the Reds. At the Reds. So we're excited about that well, as well. Well, that's great. Well, we appreciate everything that you do with the center and definitely everything that John Garion has set up and done for the last 25 years. And we look forward to having you back here again. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Larry, thanks. Back, back to you. All right, Jamie and Larry, it'll be fun to see who the winners are. Well, thank you for joining us this morning for U.S. Bank Business Watch. We'll be back next Sunday and every Sunday morning at 6.30 here on Local 12 and 10 a.m. on The CW. For more business news all week long, you can visit the Business Courier online and sign up for daily emails and follow on Twitter and Facebook. The address is CincinnatiBusinessCourier.com. I'm Peg Rosconi. Have a great Sunday.